This is Mark Dewidziak, author of Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, encouraging all of you to subscribe to Buddy Candela. <laughs> Happy Halloween, everyone, and welcome to the last episode for this season of the House of Horror podcast. Today, as our grand finale, I'm going to be talking to my good friend and former college professor, Mark Dewidziak. We really had an awesome conversation, and rather than sitting here listening to me talk about it, I'm just going to keep this intro short and sweet so we can get right to it. Mark is a great guy and a true renaissance man. He really does it all. I strongly encourage you to go to his website, markdewidziak.com, to check out all the stuff he's done, as well as pick up some of his books on Amazon. Besides his book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, if you're into spooky stuff, I highly recommend his vampire book, The Bedside Bathtub and Armchair Companion to Dracula. If you're not into horror as much, you can always check out his plethora of other books in many different types of genres, and he always has new books coming out, so make sure you keep updated with what he's publishing next. As I said, I'm going to keep this intro short and sweet, so we're going to get right to it. As always, make sure you guys subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications so you know when I post new videos. And if you give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend, it would be greatly appreciated. Without further ado, enjoy this last episode of the House of Horror podcast with Mark DeWitt. So it's actually been about a year or so since I've seen you in person. How have you been doing? How's the family? No, oh, we're good. We're good. Like I said, we're, we're just, uh, you know, uh, getting along. Um, you know, Sarah and I obviously are still, you know, uh, getting the theater gigs wherever we can. And, uh, you know, and the newspaper, well, who knows? I mean, you know, that's, <laughs> you know. Well, you've been very, very busy the past month, especially Halloween time is your busiest time of the year. Um, and I don't even know where to begin to introduce you. I obviously know you very well, but for my listeners, um, I'm talking to one of my favorite people ever, Mark Dewisiak. Um He's an author, he's an actor, he's a playwright, a director. Um, he does it all. Um, so is there anything you don't do? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I don't do windows. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, you know, I'm a writer. You know, the, the first and foremost, I'm a writer, and everything else has sort of grown out of that. Uh, whatever you, the other things that you mentioned, um, you know, I, I'm a, I'm, I'm an actor, but I'm a, you know, uh, I'm kind of a, of a bum actor. You know, my <laughs> my range is very limited, and I'm the first one to admit that. You know, I, there, there are certain things I can do and I do well. I mean, my wife's the real actress. I mean, acting is, is, uh, creating something from the ground up, whether it's close to your nature or it isn't. And I don't have that gift really. So, you know, I kind of shrivel a little bit inside when somebody, uh, refers to me as an actor. I've done a lot of acting, um, but I've always stayed very, very close to my range. I've, very, I've stayed very, very close to, uh, the, you know, I, I play Mark Twain, for instance. You know, well, for one thing, that's a very easy makeup these days. For another, um, I, I, you know, I'm playing a writer. I'm playing somebody I understand very, very well. And um, I, I'm, I don't do well when I get pretty far removed from my own personality or things that I can draw on. So um, it's a trick, is basically what it is. It's an illusion. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really not a very gifted actor. Sarah is. It's like when uh, I wrote our three-person Christmas Carol, which I don't think you ever saw. Uh, but when we did our three-person, I wrote it so that I would sort of narrate the story as Dickens. And again, I'm playing a writer. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm playing somebody I, I I understand and somebody I've studied. And then we had another actor play. Scrooge, we hired another actor, and then Sarah played 15, 16 other roles. She played men, women, ghosts, mortals, immortals, uh, children, and, uh, you know, she can do that because she's an actress. She's a real actress. So, um, so you know, when, when uh, everything else is sort of grown out of the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm a working writer. That's what I set out to do, and it's what I have been for the better part of uh, uh, more than 40 years now. And I don't really tr try to, to, to go too far el uh, other, but everything else that you, that you mentioned have re has really been an outgrowth of that. How's that for a long answer? <laughs> That's okay. Um, I think you've been quoted saying that you go on many rants and tangents, but they're very entertaining. So. <laughs> right. that, 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 that's, that's a standard, um, uh, what, what, what is the you know, qualifier or, you know, it's just, or, or, or warning label, I suppose, in most everything that I do. I always say, you know, that the, you have to put up with my rants. Yeah. But they, they are, 
yeah, you're right, you know. <laughs> I guess before we get too deep in the conversation, um, I mentioned October is your busy season. That's when you have the most shows going on. Um, you also have some books that have come out recently, and you have a new book that is coming out uh, sometime next year. Um, so while we're talking about it, kind of tell me about what's what shows you have going on and where people can buy your stuff. Well, October is our, our it is it has become our busy month. It, it, when we started uh, the theater company, December was because we got an awful lot of work for uh, Christmas Carol and our our stuff that was based on works by Dickens, and that's kind of how we built the company. But uh, and, and and we started in two thousand two, uh, but in recent years, the the demand for Dickens and Christmas Carol has uh, gone away, and the demand for the spooky stuff has gone up. And that's why October has become our busy month by far. And uh, every year we seem to add a show which sort of falls on the spooky side. And we this year, for instance, we added a show called Monsters Are Universal, um, Silver Screams in Hollywood's Golden Age, which is about uh, the whole evolution of the horror film and how Universal came to dominate it in the 1930s and why. And it's a lot of fun. It's sort of like a combination of uh, of a talk, sketch comedy, and uh, and film history. So uh, we have an awful lot of fun with that. Uh, we do a two person Edgar Allan Poe show. Um, we do a show based on my 2017 book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone. Um, and we uh, we do a show called Ghosts by the Tail, and we do a show called um, Shades of Blue and Gray: Ghosts of the Civil War, which uh, starts with Ohio. Uh, ghost stories but that's a lot of bang for the buck too because we do in addition to the ghost stories we do literary selections like walt whitman and ambrose spears emily dickinson we have uh, sarah has a beautiful singing voice so there are songs from the civil war era you get a lot of ohio history civil war history um so there's a lot packed into that show that's a that's uh and, and you get the ghost stories of course and we then we don't stay in ohio we move on to other states like Virginia and South Carolina and end up with a section on Lincoln and the sightings of Lincoln at the White House. So um, these shows uh, keep And then I do a vamp the vampire talk, of course, which is a um, an hour and 15 minute distillation of the course you took, which took 14 lectures uh, at, at about three hours each. So uh, I, I sort of take that course and shrivel it down. Yeah. To hour and 15 minutes with the vampire talk yeah so i've I, seen i've seen the peter jackson extended edition and so right. this, is, this is the regular <laughs> so the director's cut um but but basically that talk I've, I've i've been doing that talk since 2008 when my dracula book was published and so um so yeah october is definitely our busy month and uh no no question about it and it, it is uh, it, it, there's nothing. I mean, I get Mark Twain work throughout the year, you know, because Mark Twain is. If you if you looked at you know what the demand is for over the year, there's a lot of Mark Twain work, uh, both in state and out of state. Um, but I've been doing that for good heavens. Next year will mark 40 years <laughs> of playing Mark Twain. Um, I just realized that uh, the only difference is that. Um, I guess that when I was 22 when I started, um, it took me two hours to look like I, I look right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that you posted uh, on Facebook about a week ago, that, or maybe it was even more recently, that someone pulled a photo of you for a Mark Twain performance, but it was not you in the Twain getup, it was just you. Yeah, yeah, I, I was, it, was, it was one of those where you, know, you did a little bit of a double take and say, well, that was just a picture somebody took of me. <laughs> I'm not in makeup and costume, and I guess I have to... Uh, admit that the uh, the makeup process has shortened quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so what about your uh, what about your books? Where can people find them? And what what books do you have that are kind of spooky that people in the Halloween mood can get into? You know, it's it's amazing uh, how many of my books actually do fall on uh, not just the the spooky side, but uh, but are also vampiric in nature. Um, and you know, I guess I should say, and, and, and by the way, the short answer to that is always Amazon, because, um, you know, a lot of your listeners will be, you know, not attending, only a very few will be able to attend uh, programs that I'm doing in the next few days in the in the Cuyahoga County library system. So, you know, the, the number one way to, to sort of to track books down is always Amazon. Um, 
and and I've lived long enough to see some of my books become collector's items, um, which is uh, you know uh, which is an odd feeling, but uh, probably. Um, but this is kind of a long answer, but you're used to long answers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I grew up, uh, you know this because you took my class, but I grew up a, what we now call a monster kid. Uh, we didn't have that term back in the 60s. But, um, you know, I became a horror fan at the age of seven. Um, and uh, in the 1960s, there wasn't that much. It was horror wasn't like it is today, where there's it's just everywhere, and it's 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 molded to all sorts of tastes and ages, and gender and everything. Back then, you just got what you got, and you were grateful for whatever you got, whether it was an occasional Hammer horror film that would come along, or whether it was Dark Shadows on, on TV, or whether it was a rerun of an old Universal film. You were just grateful for what you had, and we all watched. It was kind of nice because we all watched the same things. We all shared the same. And, you know, so I grew up uh, enamored of, of, of the horror genre and very much under its spell. Uh, but my first two books had nothing to do with it. Uh, yeah. My first <laughs> was, was, a, was, a, was a history uh, of a theater, was a slice of theater history. And my second book was a history of the Columbo series, the mystery series. <clears throat> and that was published in 1989. Now, if you had said at that point to me, you know, 1989, the, the Columbo book is published. You know, where is your, you know, sort of career tracking? You know, I thought I would basically end up as a kind of a specialist um, in the mystery field. That's where everything was. My, my was I had a handshake deal for my next book, which was going to be on Dashiell Hammond and uh, another writer I'm, I'm just fascinated by. So I thought, well, you know, this is the, I'll follow up Columbo with, with Dashiell Hammond and that will sort of give me the foot as far as the, uh, the, the, on the right track, as far as the mystery trail goes. And, um, the Columbo book was published by the mysterious press, which was bought by Warner books and Warner books stepped in and told the mysterious press that they couldn't publish any more nonfiction books that they were from here on out a fiction press. So Warner, so mysterious press came back and we had, a uh, the deal was sewn up, but the stitchings came loose on the deal. And they said, you know, we, we, we love your Hammett book, but we're not publishing nonfiction books anymore. And it was at that moment that a small publisher in New York called and said, you know, we really love your Columbo book. And, uh, have you ever thought about doing the same type of book on the Night Stalker the series with Darren McGavin as reporter Carl Kolshak? And I said, yeah, I love that series. I just didn't know that there was a a publisher crazy enough to, to, to publish something like that. And he said, well, I'm crazy enough to publish it. And I said, well, just let me see. Let me hold on. Let me see if I can get uh, the four main contributors to that. Darren McGavin, who played Carl Kolshak, Dan Curtis, who produced uh, the, the first two movies, Richard Matheson, who uh, adapted uh, the, the first story and then wrote an original story for the second movie, um, and Jeff Rice, who created the character. If I can get the four of them to say yes to cooperate, I'll do it. And all four of them said yes right away. So if that hadn't happened, well, you probably wouldn't be talking to me right now. That's yeah. what I'm saying. You know, that was sort of the fortuitous moment that pushed me back towards the horror genre. Um, and then a little, you know, that, that became my third book. It was published as Night Stalking. And that is a very difficult book to find. That is a very, it had a limited run. Um, I wasn't very happy with the design uh, of the book, um, but it had a limited run. It did well for what it was. And then a couple years later, uh, a publisher got the rights to do original Kolshak stories. And they went to Jeff Rice and said, you know, we'd like you to write a the first original Kolshak novel in 20 years. And Jeff at that point wasn't in a position to do it. And he said, I'm not really interested. And, you know, they, he said, but I'd authorize somebody else to do it. And they said, well, who other, somebody else? And they said, well, I'd let Mark do it. And so they came to me and said, you know, you're going to write the first original Kolshak novel in 20 years. And I said, I am. And they said, yeah. And I said, well, I don't know whether I can do it or not. Um, let me come up with like four ideas. 
And if you think one of those ideas is good enough, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it. Oh, that's what we did. I did. And, and they all, everybody liked one idea. There was one idea that everybody was their favorite and was mine too. And that became Grave Secrets, which was published in 94. So I now have a horror novel to my credit. You know? And then another publisher wanted to redo the Night Stalker book um, as Night Stalking, uh, as a Night Stalker companion in 97. And that was, uh, and I really like that edition. I think that edition is is a, is a very nice edition. That led to editing uh, a collection of Richard Matheson's Kolchak scripts um, for a publisher named Gauntlet Press, um, which led to doing editing a collection of Richard's vampire scripts and stories, Bloodlines, which led to the nonfiction book about Dracula. Um, and uh, and then also writing fiction short stories and things like that for anthologies and so everything sort of got pushed back to my that love of horror that i had as a kid um but it was sort of a happy accident there's that moment in 1989 where if the hammett book had gone i may not have ever had the chance to 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 move towards the the spooky side and then the twilight zone you know um which with the book was published in 2017 I got to tell you that, I mean, this is a, uh, that was actually the book I wanted to do first. Yeah. <laughs> the Twilight Zone is my favorite series of all time. Um, and uh, I, I was working on my first book, The, the History of the, the Barter Theater, which was published in 1982. And uh, while I was working on that book, I was already thinking about the second one, because that's what writers do. And, um, I thought, oh, you know, uh, here I am. I'm, a, I'm an entertainment writer. I'm a film, uh, TV, and theater critic. And I'll, I'll write, I'll be the one to write the history of the Twilight Zone. Rod Serling is a, is a personal hero, and uh, this is what I'll do. Um, never really stopping to think that, uh, because I was working at a 50,000 circulation newspaper in East Tennessee, in Kingsport, Tennessee, that maybe Kingsport, Tennessee is not the best place to write a book about the Twilight Zone to do your research. Um, but truth be, be told, a few interviews came my way there. You know, like, uh, Donna Douglas, who is in the Eye of the Beholder, was just known for playing Emmy, Ellie Mae Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies. She actually came to down to, down to shoot a commercial. And I, I interviewed her. Um, a couple of the people who were at the Barter Theater, Claude Aikens and Fritz Weaver, are in... Uh, classic episodes of Twilight Zone. I actually was collecting interviews and kind of enough to sort of keep the illusion going that I was actually writing this book. Uh, but then what happened was what happens to a lot of writers. I walked into a bookstore around 1982 and there it was. Mark Scott Secree's The Twilight Zone Companion. The book I wanted to write. The History of the Twilight Zone. And I couldn't even be angry about it because Mark did a really good job. Far better than I ever could have dreamed or hoped I could do. And um, I, I, I love the book. But all these years, I kind of felt I was owed a Twilight Zone book. Yeah. Really, <laughs> but, you know, and I kind of thought was always in my head. But then I immediately, and, and this again shows you, you know, how fate takes a hand and how you're not really in charge of your career. Um, I immediately set my sights on my second favorite TV show, which was Columbo. And my goal in writing the Columbo book was to do as good a, a book on Columbo as Mark Scott Cree had done on The Twilight Zone. And so I spent, you know, four or five years researching and writing that book, and it was published in 1989 as The Columbo File. But if, if I'd had my druthers, it would have been The Twilight Zone. And it would have, you know, it, that, that, that book would have been The, twi the Twilight Zone, but you know, uh, it pushed me towards Columbo, but then fate pushed me back. And what I didn't see was by pushing me towards the Night Stalker and then publishing Night Stalking, then Grave Secrets, and then the collaborations with Richard Matheson, and then the Dracula book. All of this was pushing me back towards the Twilight Zone. It was creating a full circle, which I, you know, you, you don't see it when it's happening. And then after it happens, and you know, you finally get your Twilight Zone book, you go, "Oh, this is where it all started. This is like a Twilight Zone episode. This is where it all started uh, back in the early '80s." I, I, fate pushed me all back. I, that wasn't done by design. 
that wasn't done by a plan. Um, but because writers and actors, artistic people, um, by and large, when they you ask them how they got somewhere, it's always by you know out of out of left field, uh, luck, fortuitous accidents. Um, you know, you, you have to be ready for when the luck hits. That's the old the, the old cliche. You know, always be ready. You know, for when the door opens, for when the luck comes your way. You never know when it's going to come your way. And I've always tried to live up to that. But um, I'm not, I, I remember interviewing um, Brian Dennehy and uh, remarking on, to Dennehy about how he had, had a, this incredible career because Dennehy was able to do, go from doing movies like, you know, Cocoon and things like that to doing great TV movies. Uh, to doing Broadway, uh, and he would just seem to go seamlessly from 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 film to TV uh, to Broadway, and all acclaimed work, really all good stuff. And and I asked him about you know what kind of career plan uh, produces that, and he laughed. He just laughed, and I said, "What's so funny?" And he said, "You know, I'm an actor. Asking an actor what his plan is is like." Asking a man falling down a flight of stairs what his plan is. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great line. That is a really, really terrific line. And, I, and, I, and, I, and, I've, and I've used that analogy since, is that none of this was by design. Maybe it was. I mean, I don't know. But, you know, all these years later, I ended up in the Twilight Zone. All these years later, I ended up with, the, with that book. And, an, it's, 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 and it's also a terrific expression of my love for the series, Rod Serling. And also for my daughter, because that book came about about because of sharing the Twilight Zone with my daughter. It, it probably would not have come about if I, had, I hadn't as finally sat down and started showing my daughter the Twilight Zone and realizing uh, through our discussions afterwards that each episode is a life lesson. Each, each, each one is, is, is a moral. Each one is, is a cautionary tale of some kind. So our running gag after watching them, when I'd watch them and shake a finger at her and say, let that be a lesson to you, um, actually turned into, you know, the, the book. Because after a couple of weeks of doing that, the penny dropped and I realized, oh, yeah, there's a book in this. And uh, that's and so so that's uh, that's how that's, so that's always sort of gotten me back full circle. Now I'm doing a book, you know, on um, on a, a Stephen King story, you know, on a, a, a related to a Stephen King story. So um you know, it's all connected in some way. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it, it, you don't see it when it's happening. Yeah. You me you mentioned this briefly a little bit, and I know the answer to this question, but for the viewers at home, sort of take me back to the early 60s and seeing your first Universal Monster movie and what that was like, and the first time experiencing The Twilight Zone. Because I remember when I first discovered those, both of those, it was a very vivid memory for me, and I know you have memories of these as well so t take me back and tell me about the first time you were exposed to these well i never hide my age i'm 62 and i was born in 1956 and when i was seven years old so we're talking about the early 60s um a movie came on wpix channel 11 in new york uh, abbott and costello meet frankenstein the 1948 film and you have to realize I was not there for the Frankenstein half of that, that title. I was there for the first half of the title. And that's because uh, at that time there were no, uh, there wasn't a lot of children's and true children's entertainment. I mean, there were Hanna-Barbera cartoons like the Flintstones and things like that. But there wasn't a lot of stuff produced at that moment for our generation. That's kind of a later thing. Um, you know, today we take that for granted with things like Nickelodeon and the Disney Channel. But back then, um, what they gave us was the entertainment of our fathers and, in some case, our grandfathers. They gave us uh, a lot of comedy team. Uh, we got Laurel and Hardy. We got the Three Stooges. And we got Abbott and Costello. This was children's entertainment on New York to television when I was growing up. So I... I, I loved all of it. And I loved, uh, this was my introduction to movies. This was my introduction to, uh, it, it led to everything else. Everything sort of started with comedy teams. And uh, so I was there for the Abbott and Costello half of, of, of that of that title. And, uh, but I was quickly fascinated by the monster 
half of that because that that film it's it's an amazing movie because it works as both a comedy and a horror film it doesn't make fun of the horror in other words the way a mel brooks film would would do with young frankenstein um in this the horror was played straight and the comedy was played off of it so you can watch that film and it's a very effective horror film and you can watch that film and it's a very effective comedy and um I love both halves of it, but I already was a comedy fan, so that film turned me into a horror fan. Specifically, Bela Lugosi's portrayal of Dracula in that film. I think he steals the movie. He's, he's so good. Um, and, and that performance just utterly fascinated me. And then, you know, hence the character of Dracula utterly fascinated me. So... You know, it, it kind of started with that. Uh, that and, and then after that, I, I, I couldn't wait. I would scour the TV listings to see when another, you know, universal horror film was, was going to be on. And in very, very quick succession, I saw the original Dracula. I saw the uh, uh, original uh, Frankenstein sequels. And I was also starting to uh, be absorbed into the, uh, the monster culture that was there at the time. Uh, and that's... Also, uh, this may be a luck of birth, too, of when you're born. Because, you know, I was born in 1956. Uh, September of 56, Bela Lugosi died three years before I was born. Three weeks before I was born. He died on August 16th. And um, the following year, 1957, was when Universal released all of their old uh, horror films to television. Syndicated them under the title Shock Theater. And um, this not only created the, the phenomenon of the local horror host, it also, uh, it also created a generation of fans who identified themselves as horror fans. And before that, you may have been into uh, you know, horror movies and things like that. But this created not only a, a, a structure... Uh, for horror fans, it created a merchandising for horror fans. For you know, people are now specifically merchandising. It happened very fast. A couple of years after Shock Theater, you know, we get um, what basically is going to become the house organ for horror fans in the '60s, and that's you know, Forrest J. Ackerman's uh, famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. Um, yeah, and, and then there's there's merchandising that, that comes out of this. There there are, are, are and and one of the lead pieces of merchandising were the Aurora monster mo monster models. And, uh, after, um, I was, uh, I saw that first film when I was seven years old for my next birthday, I've got the, uh, the Dracula Aurora model. And then I collected, uh, you could, if I, uh, people at home can't see it. There's no, there's no video with this, right? There's first no thing. video now. <laughs> I would, I would move the camera over so I could show you the, the 13 monster models are sitting right here on my shelf. They, they've gone with me everywhere uh, since then. So, you know, there was, a, there was this kind of culture that you could immerse yourself into. It's not as, like I said, it's not as vast as it was now. And that was kind of nice because if you were a monster kid who grew up in, in, this, in the 60s, you kind of have a shared, uh, shared touchstones. You know, and those touchstones do include famous monsters of Filmland magazine and the Aurora monster models and all of that stuff. Um, there's a very, very good chance you were touched by the same stuff, you know, by the, by the same things. And also the people who would go on to create horror, like, you know, people like John Carpenter, uh, people like Stephen King, they were touched by the same stuff as well. You know, they're a little older. So, you know, what I missed was, was the, the stuff of the 50s, which would be the, uh, being in the first wave of the 50s type of stuff, like Invasion of the Body Snatchers and The Thing. And Godzilla, and also uh, Tales from the Crypt. Uh, you know, I caught up with Tales from the Crypt, the comic book. Later, you know, uh, we had different things. We, we had, we had yeah. But anyway, that that's you know, the, it was kind of nice because, like I said, we all were. You know, it, even though you, you could not communicate with people the way we do now with Facebook and Skype and things like that, it did feel like everybody was 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 on the same page. Yeah. You know? with what you were watching. Yeah. That's why the Night Stalker was so incredibly powerful in a three-network universe. If you were a horror fan, when that came along in January of 1972, you were watching it. There's no way yeah. you were watching 
you saw those promos. They started around October of the before, and everybody was talking about, are you going to watch this? Yeah, I'm going to watch it. Yeah, there's a vampire in Las Vegas running loose. Of course I'm going to watch it. So, you know, the, there was a lot of that. I mean, we all watched Night Gallery. We all watched uh, Night Stalker. We all, you know, it, it just we all watched the Hammer Horror films. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now you can be a horror fan. And I mean, I, I experienced this in teaching the class. And I, it's, I, I could say, you know, are you all into vampires? And maybe, you know, two thirds of the class would say yes. And everything that they were into was different. Yeah. You know, some of them were into the Anne Rice uh, stuff. Some of them, you know, grew up reading the Twilight books. Some of them were watching Vampire Diaries. Some of them were into the video games, like, you know, Castlevania or something else. Everybody was into something different. You know, everybody got there from a different route. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of, you know, which is, which is its own, you know, you, what I always said in, in the reviewing class, you know, you gain and you lose. Yeah. You know? And one of the things we lost was the common, the common experience. Yeah. Uh, which is nice, but now we have diversity, which is nice too. Yeah. See, I, I kind of consider myself an old soul because I was very spoiled as a kid with television, I guess good television, because my dad was always watching the Andy Griffith show. He was watching MASH. He was watching all these old shows that a lot of people don't really watch that much anymore. And that's how I got introduced to the Universal Horrors because he had fallen asleep one night with the TV on and I go downstairs and I think the first one I watched was The Mummy's Ghost. Is that the one where at the end the they walk into the, like the pond and she turns old? Is that The Mummy's Ghost? I think so, but you know what? Those mummy, the, those later mum, the Karis Mummy movies, you know, I, the, I, I have to check on titles. And I've seen them all over and over again. But the titles, I'm not good on. Whether it's The Mummy's Hand or The Mummy's Ghost, The Mummy's Tomb, you know, whichever. Yeah. <laughs> Like, but that that was the first one I saw, and that scared the crap out of me. And then I didn't watch horror movies for a long time, but then when I got back into it, I rewatched all the Universal Horrors. So I guess I'm kind of spoiled in that regard, because I was exposed to these at a young age. But a lot of people in my generation don't even watch anything in black and white or have heard of these shows. No, and, and, and that's just, you know, that's just, you know sometimes, sometimes people... There was a... Um, uh, a review of the the Twilight Zone book on Goodreads, which you know, because I mentioned in the in the the, the forward to uh, uh, that, just observationally, the fact that uh, uh, particularly television, black and white television, is um, is going away as far as you know, uh, each with each generation watches less and less of the old black and white television. And that's just the truth. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just the truth. And I, I, I you know, and I, and I demonstrated it by, you know, asking every semester, you know, who watches what, you know. And the Andy Griffith show held on much longer than, than most. I mean, the Honeymooners was gone a long time ago. The, the fact that there was, you know, the Honeymooners was once a, a show which you could reference and everybody would get the references. Uh, the lines and the characters, those characters were iconic. You know, gradually, the Honeymooners slipped away. One show after another slipped away. And the Andy Griffith show, I get maybe one student out of, you know, would, would get, at, towards the end, I was getting maybe one student out of 20. And they always said the same thing, which was my father and my grandfather watched it with me. You know, uh, it's gone. It, 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 Mayberry, this is, you know, the first generation that has not lived in Mayberry, that does not consider Mayberry, you know, in some way their hometown. You know, well, the person who, you know, reviewed this on Goodreads was, was sort of saying, you know, like, oh, this is some old fart, uh, <laughs> you know, ranting against the, the kids of, because they're not watching black and white. I said, no, it's not. I, I, you, you, whoever, the, you know, I didn't respond to it, but I thought, you know, you, com you know that that's not the way I taught that class. And you know yeah. that that what I was saying, it's just the verifiable truth. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's also got nothing to do with, uh, the, you know, kind of your decision because you have to be exposed to it. You have to be in some way, there has to be a catalyst. There has to be a spark. Um, if all you're being given is Nickelodeon or uh, the Disney channel, and that's what you're being exposed to, how do you get to those other things? You're lucky if you have, you know, a father, or, you know, or a mother, or, or whatever, who's 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 
going to say, hey, why don't you give this a try? And it really helps if you, if it, if you get exposed to it when you're young because nothing has impact on you like when, you, when you're young. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's very, very difficult to get into something. Uh, you know, I, I, I talked to this, about this with, with Leonard Maltin once um, because both of our daughters love the comedy of Laurel and Hardy. And my, you know this, you know, the students who are in class with you don't even know who Laurel and Hardy are, let alone seen any of their films. Uh, you know, I'd say the names Laurel and Hardy and I would get blank stares. And you, it, it, Laurel and Hardy's comedy is very slow. It's very deliberate. It's very character based. And if you get that when you're very, very young, you might buy into it. But when you're a little bit older and, you know, you're accustomed to a little bit faster pace and you're accustomed to uh, something which is which is served up, you, you just, you're just never going to go to it. It's just not going to happen. And that's just the truth. I just, it's not like I said, it's not a judgment. It's just it's just the truth. Yeah. Um, but the two gets back to the main point, which is that the two black and white TV shows which continue to jump generationally. And, you know, the other thing, too, is how little jumps generation to generation. You know, a point I made in the class a couple times is that there's very, very little that actually jumps in music, in movies, one generation to another. And the two, uh, the two TV shows, black and white TV shows, which continue to jump, are um, I Love Lucy... People still know the Ricardos. They still know Lucy. And if you want to know if something is jumping generationally, stop and see and whether or not they merchandise for it. Yeah. <laughs> and they still merchandise Lucy. And the other is the Twilight Zone. And um, my students not only knew the Twilight Zone, iconically, they knew the episodes. You say, oh, the gremlin on the wing or the broken glasses. Or something. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they've been exposed to it one way or another. And... Um, the rest has sort of disappeared, you know? So it, it, it's like I said, I got into black and white stuff because that's what they gave us. You know, it's, it's not like we were superior in the sixties or anything. It's not, it's just the way it was. It's just the fact that we were given that as our entertainment. If uh, we had not been given the three stooges and Abbott and Costello and Laurel and Hardy, and then a little bit later, the Marx brothers as our sort of primary stuff, then maybe, you know, this wouldn't have happened. But when you do that, one thing leads to another. You know, one th thing always leads to another. So you're there. So this led to the horror stuff, you know. And then if you're watching horror films, maybe you see an actor like Basil Rathbone in some of these horror movies. You know, and your dad says, well, he played Sherlock Holmes. And then you watch those Sherlock Holmes movies. And then you see actors who were in those. And one thing leads to you just go from, you know, one, one, one thing. And the next thing you know, you're watching all of Hollywood history. You're interested yeah. in but there's got to be a door into that and for a lot of people that door doesn't exist anymore yeah you know, culture doesn't provide it to them yeah i know when i was when i was in college i lived with a couple different roommates and at one point i was watching ed wood like the 90s movie ed wood happens to be in black and white and a couple of my roommates came home and they're like oh we're not watching this it's in black and white and like they went upstairs i was like this was made in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, yes, you know, and and, and I and I've actually had students which will say, um, I, I I don't watch black and white or I can't watch black and white, and I always say, well, you know, that may or may not be true, but well, let's put it to the test. And I always have a couple of films I recommend they watch, and then say, come back and then tell me you can't watch black and white. Yeah, one of them is the nineteen fifty six version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And often enough, people come come back and say, "Wow, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. is there any? Are there any more at home like you? Can I? What else? Yeah, you got any more? Oh yeah, I got more like this. You know, um, you know, if you watch the wrong black and white movie for the first time, it can it can turn you off. Yeah. You know? So I think it's important to, to to have an immersive experience, which sort of prepares you later on for those things. Yeah. You know." can't start with with war and peace you've got to start with something a little bit more yeah you know accessible or whatever so i, I you know and, and that's a good rorschach i think if, if you're turned on by that invasion of the body snatchers is a good chance you'll like more yeah, yeah I, right 
I guess getting into recommendations from the black and white era. Okay, so Universal monster movies. Dracula's a given. Like, I sh we shouldn't have to tell any people, go see Dracula, because you should just do it. But, you should, and, and mo but also with the caveat that it's not a very well-made movie. Yeah, uh, so you're going there for the performance, not for... Lugosi's it, performance that you're there for. I think, I think you've even said that that's the most influential bad movie ever made or something like that. That's, that's actually David, uh, David Skull's line, who's a very fine Dracula uh, and, and Stoker uh, scholar. And uh, I think David was the one who called it uh, the most influential bad movie ever made, uh, which I don't agree with. It's not a bad movie by any means. That, that is an overstatement. Um, David always likes to tell a story because he grew up in Cleveland. And uh, Cleveland didn't get the Universal Horror Films uh, package uh, in 57. And he always heard about Dracula and he'd never seen it. And, and he was actually like 13, 14 when he first saw it. And he had built it up in his mind that it was this great movie. It was this fantastic, and then he, he saw it was disappointing in it. So I, I, I think that that's, you know, one thing. It was personal to him. Uh, but, you know, when the film, the second half of the film is very static. Yeah. Very uh, and it is like Todd Browning forgot he was making a movie in the second half. But Lugosi's performance and Dwight Fry's performance and Edward Van Sloan's performance as Van Helsing all hold up very, very well. Yeah. And it is, you know, obviously, you know, a reason to see, you know, the films. But, you know, all those old horror films, um, you know, they, they were shot with such imagination and they were shot with such, you know, uh, you know I mean, Cheney's. 1925 version of the phantom of the opera is just you know yeah. it's an amazing piece of work it's an amazing you know you look at his makeup you look at what he did you look at those sets uh it's just it, it's an amazing film um you know it, it, all like i said all of those movies um even some of the lesser known ones uh the ones that uh aren't in like the pantheon of like uh, frankenstein dracula and the wolfman werewolf of london is a really interesting film uh, you know uh, yeah the Invisible Man holds up very well. Mm -hmm. My goodness, that's a good movie. Uh, so, I, I matter, as a matter of fact, you know, James Whale, who directed The Invisible Man, is best known for directing Frankenstein and the sequel, Bride of Frankenstein. And those are the two films that he gets the most acclaim for. I think The Invisible Man's a better movie. I think it's his best, his best universal horror film. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the one where the humor is actually in proportion to, uh, to the horror story. Yeah. And I love Marlowe's interpretation. Yeah. I love The Invisible Man. The other one that I think is my favorite, because I think my top five is like Dracula, The Invisible Man, the original Wolfman, and then the one I think might be the best, but I'm not sure, is Son of Frankenstein. I think that you one... Know, this has come up... I, 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 I've heard maybe three or four people say this to me just over the last few days, that they think Son of Frankenstein's the best of the Frankenstein movie, which is interesting because it's the least of the Karloff performances. But I don't think I disagree with it. It's it's it, it first off, the sets harken back to all those great German expressionism films. Uh the, the origins of the horror film, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu. So the sets are just amazing. Um it's a film with a with an, its own antic sense of humor. Um but the, the humor is endemic to the characters. It, it's, it doesn't sort of get out of hand like it does a little bit in Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, you have Lugosi's amazing performance, who pretty much steals the movie as Igor, and a role which should have convinced everybody in Hollywood that he was not a one-role actor. He could have played much more than Dracula. And then sadly, it didn't. He's really, uh, he's really good at Island of Lost Souls, too. Yes, I mean, even though Lugosi would give him a chance. You know, he's good in the, 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 the Edgar Allan Poe-inspired uh, films, they did, like the, the Black Cat and the Raven, uh, where he and Karloff trade playing the sympathetic characters. Um, he's really good in both of those films. So, you know, he, they should have seen that Lugosi was capable of, of much more. Uh, uh, you know, that was, that was Hollywood's crime. You know? yeah. poor, poor Bella was not well. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. That 39 version, you know, has that weird kid, you know, well, hello, kid, <laughs> who runs throughout that movie. You know, it has, uh, you know, and Karloff has, when he is given his moments, boy, he takes advantage of those moments. And and Rathbone. 
Rathbone's performance is, you know, uh, it's kind of, it, it's got the manic quality of Colin Clive, but it has levels that Clive's performance doesn't have. Yeah. So, yeah, I kind of agree. I think it's it, it may be the best of the three. And, you know, and that's almost sacrilege to say it, because I think almost everybody would go to Bride of Frankenstein. Yeah. Which is also, I mean, Doctor Pretorius is one of the best villains. Oh well, what a what a what a role, what a performance, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I guess transitioning out of the Universal monsters, what can you tell me about when you first got into the Twilight Zone? Do you remember the first episode? You, I remember my first episode was Mirror Image, but do you remember what your first episode was? Yeah, I do. Um, and actually, I should I should you know uh, point out that again, this is all a matter of age. I was just a little bit too young for um, the original run of the Twilight Zone. Uh, the original run of the Twilight Zone ends in '64, and I was seven years old. You know, the, the, that it was the same year that I discovered having Costello meet Frankenstein. But yeah, I was aware of the Twilight Zone, you know, up to that age because it was on, and everybody, you know, it was referenced, and you knew it was a, you were aware it was it was there, but it wasn't a show for you know a, a five six year old. Uh, so in its prime, I did, I, I didn't watch it. I was not aware. Of, I, I was aware of it, but I was not, uh, but the great thing about growing up in New York in this era was that that same station that showed, uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, WPIX channel 11. They immediately started running the twilight zone the, the, in, in syndication. That's when I discovered it. Um, probably about the age of nine. And, um, and the first episode I, I saw, I think, and, and, and I've, I've got this in the book, that I often ask the question, not what is your favorite Twilight Zone episode, not what do you think is the best Twilight Zone episode, but what Twilight Zone episode scared you the most? What one really got under your skin and unnerved you? And that's rarely the same one that your favorite or uh, you think is the best episode. And one of the episodes that really got to me was a fifth season episode called Ring a Ding Girl. And that was the first one I watched. I, I thought it had a really disturbing quality to it. Um, yeah, it's the one about the actress who goes back to her hometown. And she has been sent a ring by her fan club, and she could see glimpses of the future in the ring. And I thought, you know, this this episode just really, it, it, and and I and I and I play along because I said in the book that the two episodes that I found to be the, the scariest were Ring a Ding Girl and Twenty Two, the one with the uh, about the uh, yeah singer who is in the hospital. She's had a breakdown, and she keeps dreaming that she she goes down to the morgue and this spooky woman keeps coming out and saying, you know, room for one more, honey. Um, and I, as I think those two episodes were the ones that scared me the most, but, uh, for some reason, when I started watching the twilight zone, uh, whatever it was, it was late in the, the, the run of showing fifth season episodes. So a lot of the early ones that I saw were not ones that fans would consider the best episodes. Even. Uh, there were episodes um, like Stopover in a Small Town. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember, you know, uh, from Agnes with Love. I mean, I remember seeing a lot of those like, early Twilight Zone episodes. And I didn't care, They, you know, because at that age, you don't have the same level of discrimination you're going to have a few years later. Um, I love the Twilight Zone. I fell in love with the Twilight Zone for the same reason most people do when they first see it. I love the spooky, eerie feeling you got when you got to the payoff, um, I wasn't there for the uh, morality tales or the life lessons or any of that. I didn't know that was in there. Um, I was just there for the spooky payoff. And, yeah. You know, that, that same feeling you get when, you know, somebody tells a story around the campfire and, you know, one of those urban legend stories. And the whole idea is to give you know, that wonderful spooky feeling going up your spine and making the hairs on the back of your neck go up. That's what I was there for. And, um, and, and it worked. I mean, it worked, it, 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 you know, but, you know, as I got older, I realized there was something underneath all of that. There was, there was something uh, going on behind all of that. And that's one of the, the great things about the Twilight Zone. You can watch it 
when you're young and just watch it for that reason. And then gradually, as you get older, you can rewatch those episodes and appreciate them on, on, on whole different levels. Uh, they just, but yeah, those, those are the first ones I remember. Those are those, but you know, by the, uh, by the time night gallery premiered, um, I, I was, you know, uh, I had seen most of the Twilight Zones, and I, um, you know, was a, was a very you know, avid uh, Rod Serling fan at that point, and um, you know, uh, I guess you know, one I won't call it a regret because you know it's not really a regret, but obviously, you know, I never got the chance to meet Rod Serling. You know, he died at the age of fifty in nineteen seventy five. Um, and I was a, in college at the time, and uh, I, I, I was a sophomore. Uh, I had just completed my sophomore year, and I was driving cross-country. Uh, and I can remember where I was because I was driving through upstate New York uh, when the radio uh, announced that Rod Serling had died. And he died in Rochester, in upstate New York. He was not that far away from where I was driving. The news came over the radio. Uh, so now, you know, where the universe gifted me was that uh, I later got the friendship of two very, very key people. One, Richard Matheson, you know, who was one of the, the other primary writers on the show. Um, and uh, Rod's daughter, Anne, who wrote the foreword to the book and has become a very, very close and near friend um, over the past uh, the past five six years. Yeah, and she's also written a very good book, which I recommend <laughs> everyone go read. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, I, I have said this many times that that Anne's book about her dad, you know, is a gift to all of us who will never get to meet Rod Serling. And if you want to get to meet the, the real Rod Serling, not the not 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 the guy on TV with the clip voice and the the introduction to the Twilight Zone, that guy, you know. He didn't talk like that away from that. That was his on-camera delivery. And, you know, the real Rod Serling had an antic sense of humor, you know, loved to stand on his head in restaurants and imitate a gorilla. And, you know, he had this just uh, really impish sense of humor. And this was, he wasn't that guy. And that guy who loved dogs and loved to get down on the ground and play with dogs as if he were a litter mate with them. That guy you'll meet in Anne's book, and you'll fall in love with him. So, yeah, I, I agree, buddy. I think that uh, that book is, is a very, very special book. Yeah. Um, so, going back to your book, I mean, you touched upon how you got the inspiration to write the book. Um, but it, it's called Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone. And, I don't know, kind of tell me a little bit more. Because I, I really like the book. Um, and something that would have been so easy to do is just do another history book, just do another thing. But this book, is it's really more of like a conversation, really. Thank you. I mean, I, I appreciate it because that's what I, I set out to do. I set it up to be a series of conversations um, with, you know, like little essays uh, in a very conversational style. Of, of, and so you could pick it up anywhere. So you could pick up any chapter and just read. It didn't have to be linear. You could just dive in at any point or go back or whatever. And um, that was the, the design of the book. And you're absolutely right. Um, when when I realized that this was my Twilight Zone book, uh, and luckily my agent agreed, uh, you know, I, I the, you're right. The, the, the histories had been written. If, if there had been any, you know, uh, temptation to add to what Mark Scott Secree had done in the 1980s, that was pretty much blown out of the water by Martin Graham's book, uh, which is an exhaustive uh, study of uh, the Twilight Zone and really goes into deep detail about uh, the budgets and the productions and, and what was done and where and such and, and such. So the histories have been written and they have been and they're very, and, you know, they're 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 all very good. I mean, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I love Martin's book and I, and I love Mark's book. So. But they, they certainly eliminated any temptation to do a history of the Twilight Zone again. Um, but at the same time, you know, I thought, well, you know, I've, I, the, over the years, I've done all of these interviews with people who were on the show. And I got to know a lot of people who were on the show. 
you know, they, they, there should be a way to use this. There should be a way to use all of this. Ah, I know. <laughs> I'll put it all into this book. I'll put everything that, you know, all those experiences and all of that. And um, we'll use that as, as grist for the mill. Uh, and so, yeah, it is, you know, this book was a real gift for me, you know. And uh, Sarah's, it's, of all my books... Um, it's Sarah's favorite. My wife, uh, it's her, and I think it's her favorite because um, it has the most of me in it. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's 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 a personal book, but sometimes, you know, the trick is to make a personal book everybody's book. You know, to make it uh, to make it be everybody's journey, everybody's show, which it is, uh, and that's why you know. It, these are 50 life lessons from the twilight zone, but they're, they're not the life lessons. They're my life lessons. They're, they're This is what I got out of the show. You know, one of the, the unsaid part of this is that, uh, you know, what are, what did you get out of it? You know, uh, this is just something to bounce your opinion you know, off of or your experience off of, because somebody can watch the exact same episode and come up with a, a an entirely different interpretation or entirely different lesson. And good metaphoric storytelling allows for that, uh, and the Twilight Zone certainly does. And so I love the f when somebody comes up to me and says, "You know what I got out of that episode?" You know, I can't wait to hear what they're going to say because it's 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 it's, it's not that's their lesson, and that's what this is all about. You know, what, what what did you get out of it? What did you bring away from it? And uh, that's why I also included guest lessons in the book. I solicited. Uh, as many as I could. I wanted 50 guests. Uh, I, I fell short. I think there are 33, 34 guest lessons in the book. And I I wanted 50, but, you know, I ran out of time. So, but they're, uh, I, they're scattered throughout the book. And they're are, they are from Twilight Zone fans. They're from Twilight Zone historians. Uh, Martin Grahams and Mark Scott Sacree both sent one. Uh, Robert Redford and Carol Burnett, who were in Twilight Zone episodes, sent one. Uh, People in the horror field like Greg Nicotero, uh, just Twilight Zone people I didn't know were Twilight Zone fans. And I found out were Twilight, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mel Brooks. I, I didn't know they were Twilight Zone fans. Uh, who knew? But uh, they both sent wonderful guest lessons. And they come up with interpretation. And, and, and they, they saved my butt in at least <laughs> one very uh, uh, strong in instance of that. And that's the Invaders. Um you know, it's one of the most iconic episodes. You know, Agnes Moorhead as the, uh, the the farm woman in the isolated farmhouse, and her house is being invaded by aliens, by these little aliens. And, uh, you know, and it builds up to a memorable payoff, of course. Um, but I, for the life of me, could not think of a life lesson to put on that. You know, and on the, on the other hand, how do you leave out the invaders? How do you leave out one of the most famous episodes of all time. I, and, and I was, I was really worried going in because I kept thinking about that episode and thinking, what is the lesson? Don't, don't be trapped in an isolated farmhouse when there's an alien invasion. What, what, what is the lesson of that episode? Well, two of the people that I had solicited uh, guest lessons from Neil deGrasse Tyson and the TV historian, David B and Cooley, both went to the invaders as their episode, and they came up with a lovely uh, interpretations of that episode. And I also had a great picture of Agnes Moorhead, and I wanted to use that picture. But if I hadn't had a life lesson to go with it, yeah. it would have been using the picture for the sake of using the picture. So I not only got to include the invaders, I got to use my picture, too. So, uh, yeah. So, so those life lessons also, they not only open up the book and show how how open these things are to interpretation. They also, like, uh, like I said, in some ways, they enhance the book because they allowed me to cover more territory. Yeah. And another thing I like about the book is it's not just for Twilight Zone fans. I think anyone can get something out of this book, and I think people who have never even watched the Twilight Zone, this can kind of turn them on to it. I hope so. I hope so. And, and I think you're right because, I, you know, publishers aren't in the charity business. And if this book was only going to have reached Twilight Zone, St. Martin's would have never published it. You know, uh, so I, I agree with that. I think that that's exactly right. 
and I think that they they did um, um, publish it because they did believe that uh, there would be a sale beyond an interest from more than just the Twilight Zone fans. Yeah. Um, I hate the term guilty pleasure because it gives the the essence that something is inherently bad, which is not true. Um, so I guess, for me, the episode that's not a guilty pleasure, but one of my favorite episodes that a lot of people don't talk about is probably Hocus Pocus and Frisbee. Mm -hmm. Ma mainly because, like, it's not, the story isn't that original, like, everyone knows it's just the boy who cried wolf, but that character is just so entertaining that that's one of my favorite episodes. Do you have one that's just an episode that no one else gets, but you really get it? I don't know. I mean, it, uh, I, I really enjoy the Twilight Zone, uh, you know, from so many different levels. Um, you know, and some of the later episodes do get tired and they, they were repetitious. And even then you'll get some people who uh, will come up to you and say that, you know, uh, the bewitching pool is their favorite episode. You know, and you and, and you go, really? Wow. You know, ones that, that generally get uh, beaten up pretty badly. Um, but I, you know, I do have like, you know, uh, disagreements with, you know, but the big one probably is you're to sort of do this in reverse is the episode. Everybody loves is an episode. I don't love. Oh yeah. Uh, and you talk about this in the book as well. <laughs> that's, that's, and, and that's time enough at last, you know, um, now it, it, before, you know, people start lighting torches and act like a mob in a Frankenstein movie. Let me say, you know, I think this is a, this is a gorgeously produced episode. It contains an incredible performance by, by Burgess Meredith. It contains probably the most iconic image from the twilight zone. And that's the broken glasses and it's well shot and it's well done, but it's a bit of an outlier, uh, because in the twilight zone, uh, people are, rewarded and punished by what they bring into the twilight zone uh, you know people who bring in greed and prejudice and pettiness and meanness you know they they are paid in kind in the twilight zone they generally are making a target of themselves for a bolt of cosmic justice and this guy didn't really do anything to deserve a fate that incredibly awful um you know he he is not the villain of the piece in fact, the people who were presented in the villain of the piece, are, you know, his wife, his boss, uh, and the wife is just terrible. I mean, I don't know that there is a more cruel moment in all five seasons of The Twilight Zone than the moment she hands him the poetry book and says, you know, Henry, read to me from this book of poetry. And he's thinking, at last, she's got it. She understands my love of reading. He loves, understands my love of great literature, and he opens the book, and she has defaced every page so it's unreadable. Um, that may be the most cruel moment in all five seasons of The Twilight Zone. And then, you know, you get, you builds off to this horrible, horrible payoff uh, for Henry. And, and yet everybody, you know, this comes up very high on the list of favorite episodes. And, uh, you know... Now I did include that as a, I did I did gather a life lesson from that and you know you, you know because you've read the book the life lesson actually came from my mother because my mother loved one of her favorite expressions we were five rowdy kids and uh, there were always a lot of fights but when one of us would go and complain to my mother and say you know wail at her that that wasn't fair my mother's favorite response was nobody said life was fair her favorite one of her favorite lines nobody said life was fair and it's true so maybe this is the one episode that says life isn't fair because henry himself says that at the end when the glasses break and he holds up the shattered the remains of those those lenses and he looks through them and he says that's not fair and we agree with him that's not fair it isn't fair and maybe that is the life lesson of that one i like the life lesson i put on it but it is still not my favorite Burgess Meredith episode. I, I far prefer The Obsolete Man. I far prefer that as a, as a lesson. And also about its, its celebration of reading. You know, as reading is books and reading has become increasingly endangered, time enough at last it doesn't look as good and The Obsolete <laughs> Man looks better. You know, yeah. uh, 
So I, I, you know, I'm a, and I love the obsolete man. I love the performances. I love, you know, it's my, it, it is one, it's definitely top five for me as far as the Twilight Zone goes. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's probably impossible. Can you name your top five? That's going to change depending on the day you ask it. Um, but I, but I would always put the monsters are doing Maple Street in that top five. I don't know that any episode has grown in resonance as significantly and as profoundly as the monsters are doing Maple Street. I was going to say that's probably one that's like might even be more relevant today. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, you know, Rod clearly was talking about the McCarthy era. He was talking about the the, the Red Scare at a time when neighbor could look on neighbor with with, with, with suspicion and doubt. And doubt would lead to fear, which would lead to mistrust, which would lead to to open warfare. Um, you know, he was clearly talking about that awful time when everybody was looking at everybody and wondering whether they were a communist or not. But, you know, as we have become more divided as a nation uh, for any time since the Civil War, um, that episode... Has grown, and you know the the lesson I put on it, which is a fairly obvious one, which is is divided we fall. That if we do not get it, find a way to start talking to each other, if we do not find a way to start living with each other, we ain't gonna make it. That's just the 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 the, the plain fact. It's the plain fact of history, and it's the plain fact of the Twilight Zone. We are not going to make it. We are a united state, uh, e pluribus unum, out of many one, um, and as the Historian Arthur Schlesinger said, "We have reached a point in our history where we have a whole lot more. We need a whole lot less pluribus and a whole lot more unum." And he's right. And so that episode, that cautionary tale, is um, it, it just it, it's amazing. I think everybody in America needs to be sat down and shown that episode. You know, yeah. uh, as 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 you know, go where we're heading. And if we don't, if we don't get our act together, so anyway, that's a that I think is a that is is definitely top five for me. Um, you know, as is the obsolete man. You know, those two are going to come in very very strong. Uh, walking distance, you know, because it was very special to Rod and anybody who has made the pilgrimage back to Binghamton and knows what a hometown looks like and feels like for Rod Serling, that episode is going to be top five for me as well. So you know, you know, and there are a bunch of others which will go in and out. Passage for Trumpet is a is a, is a, is a favorite. Um, yeah, in praise of Pip, it's very good. Oh my goodness, that's a great Jack Klugman performance. Um, but so many, so many of them. You know, the, the Nightmare Twenty Thousand Feet. You know, is is always going to be up in, in, in that grouping. You know, so yeah. yeah. There have been. There have been rumors online that Jordan Peele is producing a new series based on the Twilight Zone. Are those just rumors, or is that is that something that's happening? And what do you think about that? That's a fact. <laughs> that's happening. That is a fact. Uh, CBS is, is going to to air it next year. Uh, no, they they've already um, uh, appointed a showrunner and everything else. Um, I, I, my 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 early feel is that these will be original stories. These will be uh, all originally original stories, and uh, um, you know, and I and of course have mixed feelings about it. You know, um, deeply ambivalent feelings about this. On the one hand, you know, anything that sort of promotes the Twilight Zone, I'm for. You know, anything that sort of raises the profile of the Twilight Zone, I'm for. You know, and Jordan Peele, you know, if you were going to sort of look around and say, you know. Well, who should do this? He's not a bad choice, you know, to uh, uh, to do a new Twilight Zone. You know, I'm kind of curious to see what he's going to do. Uh, I was a fan of the 1985 revival. Yeah, I was going to ask what you think because this isn't the first time it's been done. You know, this will be the the, the this will be the the third revival. You know, the fourth series called Twilight Zone. And I like the 1985 series. Um, it was a little uneven. But, you know, you could argue so is the original. Um, amazing people worked on it. Wes Craven, Harlan Ellison, you know, Rockne O'Bannon, some guy named George R. R. Martin. I don't know what ever became of him, but 
on it. Um, you know, you had some amazing talents, and they did some really, really good stuff on that, uh, from both the scripts and the directors who were involved. And I look forward to it. It was on Friday nights. I look forward to it. Uh, even as I recognized that it was not and could never really be the Twilight Zone. Yeah. You know, because unless you can resurrect uh, Rod Serling and that group of writers, you go, that's the DNA. That's the that's the, the true Twilight Zone. And everything else that you're sort of doing after that, you're doing an anthology series, you know. And, well, why not call it something else? Why not call it Black Mirror? You know, why not yeah. call it uh, <laughs> Tales from the Dark Side? Why don't you call it, you know, any number of things? You know, do your own anthology series, and you can be inspired by the Twilight Zone all you want. In the in the long run, um, this series may be good and it may be bad, but if it's good, it'll be a good series, just another really, really good anthology series that's been inspired by the Twilight Zone, and we're calling it the Twilight Zone. And you know, again, that's all right with me. Yes, owns it; they can do what they want, um, and nothing ever touches the original, so that's all right. I always love people who say, you know, well, you know, that's a ruin the original. How? <laughs> Yeah, I never understood that. That's right here. They look fine. You know, just, how in the world would it touch the original? I mean, it's it's a silly argument. You know, you know that there have been two series versions of Casablanca, one in the 1950s and one in the early 80s with David Soul. You know, and both series were just, I mean, they were beyond awful. <laughs> you don't know about them. Nobody knows about them. But at the time... Everybody said, you know, oh, this is this is this is sacrilege. This is, you know, going to this is going to destroy the original. It's like, no, it's not. It can't touch the original. It has not hurt Casablanca in any way, shape, or form. You yeah. know, so you know, I, I'm not at, at all concerned about that. Uh, you know, and I'm actually pleased that it, it will raise the profile of the Twilight Zone. But at the same time, I also know, you know, this this can't be. You know, you you want a, a, a new anthology series which uh, looks at uh, the themes of the Twilight Zone with a you know, 2018, 19 perspective. Well, we already have it. It's called Black Mirror. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, that, and that's the other thing is, you know, um, uh, I'm kind of glad it's ended up in Jordan Peele's hands. But on the other hand, I'm also thinking, wow, you talk about a tall order. Yeah. You know, you're not only competing with the memory of the original Twilight Zone, which is like competing with a ghost, by the way, and you'll never win it. You're not only competing with that, because so people will be saying, is this equal to what the original Twilight Zone is? You're also competing with shows like, you know, Black Mirror that, that have been done recently. You know, that people are also going to be saying, is this as good as Black Mirror? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> It's in a tough spot, no doubt about it. And Black Mirror was smart enough to be its own thing. I mean, truth be told, now, the creator of Black Mirror has told anybody who wants to listen that his inspiration was the Twilight Zone. You know, I'll take him on his word. But Black Mirror isn't the Twilight Zone. Yeah. It's very much its own thing. In fact, if anything, it owes as much to the Outer Limits as it does the Twilight Zone. Yeah. There's so much of that cautionary stuff about future technology. That's the Outer Limits. Uh, yeah. Much more than it is the Twilight Zone. But Black Mirror is very much its own thing. So... You give yourself the liberty of doing your own thing and yet be inspired by the Twilight Zone. Yeah. You know, the only thing that CBS All Access is getting is that name, this. You know, and that name is potent. As we've already said, you know, that name has got a lot of cachet. And that's great. But wow, talk about stuff to live up to. Talk about what you're going to be competing with. Yeah. Um, a lot of my listeners are Disney fans. So I wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about the Tower of Terror attraction at Disney World? Because I know Anne and her book is kind of critical about it, so I just didn't know if you had any thoughts about that. I, and, you know, uh, Anne has a, a you know a, a very good reason for I think that, um, and that's this: in some way, she has seen her father transformed into a um, horror figure in the pantheon. Somewhere, you know, between, uh, uh, you know, Boris Karloff and Freddy Krueger. And, you know, her dad was a writer, you know, and, and 
does uh, does some of the Twilight Zone trade in the horror genre? Yes. It was Night Gallery a horror series? Yes. But Rod Serling's you know uh, output, which is you know for somebody who only lived to be fifty, is staggering. You know, it's it's a very wide output, and we you know we the pop culture has transformed Rod Serling that that figure that guy in the suit with the cigarette talking in the clipped tones into a iconic figure and that figure is generally associated with the really spooky side of the street and i think and you know wants to make sure that people rep- recognize that her dad was a, was an incredibly versatile writer and he was just using uh, science fiction and fantasy and horror to metaphorically address the themes that he was always interested in because Rod's themes don't change. They're the same themes, whether he was writing uh, straight dramas in the 1950s for live, for live television. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, that, you know, first off, it's called the Tower of Terror, you know, so, you know, and then secondly, it is built to, be, to duplicate somewhat of like a haunted house, you know, where Rod is sort of the host of the haunted house. <laughs> You know, and this is like playing into that whole that that whole thing, you know. And 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 I guess I would have ambivalent feelings on that too. I mean, on one hand, it would be nice to see something, you know, on a Disney level, uh, embracing the Twilight Zone, embracing that creation. On the other hand, it's playing to that you know very limited uh, view of Rod that um, you know that he becomes just you know uh, another spookmeister. And, you know, and Rod was obviously a lot more than that. You know. That's somewhat American culture, though. I mean, you know, I don't know whether I talked about this in the, 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 the vampire class or not. But, you know, Americans, 20th century Americans, really fell in love with labels. We love to put labels on something. You know, all of America sort of turned into, you know... Uh, People who study bugs who want to pin something down, identify it, and put a label on it, you know. And so, this was really hurt a lot of you know people who's in careers and so you know such as like we think of Stephen King, and the, I just said Stephen King. In some part, of your brain just went horror writer because that's the label we have put on Stephen King, you know. And it's the label that he's had to embrace commercially. You know? Now, I think if, you know, you talk to Stephen King, he would just say, you know, I'm a writer. You know, I write what I'm interested in. Well, he doesn't sit and go, I'm a horror writer. Well, the culture has sort of made that. You know, if you look at the writers in the century directly before that, the people who basically established the territory, the ground, Mary Shelley. Edgar Allan Poe, Rom Stoker, Robert Louis Stevenson. These guys didn't consider themselves horror writers. They just considered themselves writers. And if the best way to tell the story happened to be a spooky story, that's what they would do. But then, you know, in Robert Louis Stevenson's case, you know, one minute he's writing Treasure Island, the next minute he's writing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. One minute he's writing A Child's Garden of Verses, the next read writing the body snatcher he writes landmark horror but nothing part of your brain went robert louis stevenson horror writer yeah <laughs> because the, the label we didn't start labeling until you know where people had to specialize and people had to do you know this happens in movies too you know uh, wes craven did you know he only becomes a horror writer because that's the, what the opportunity opened up for him you know and then he became like a specialist in the horror field but, you know, it's not like he started his career thinking, you know, I'm going to be a horror director. And this is the, you know, the thing which, which we have seen with an awful lot of, of this is that now we demand people specialize because we want to get, a, we want to get our hand around it. We want to get our mind wrapped around it. Like, you know, well, I write. Well, well what do you write? I write what I'm interested in. I write whatever, you know, why don't you go find out? Instead of me making this easy for you. Well, do you write mystery? Do you write romance? Do you write westerns? Do you write, uh, do you write horror? Do you write science fiction? What do you write? Well, why don't you decide? 
You know, and I think when Anne sees her dad reduced to that, it's it's bothersome for her. And I agree with that, by the way. I think it's, you know, if, if, if all you know is Rod Serling and your interest in Rod Serling begins and ends with that, you're missing a whole lot of who the man was and and what he did. And And I love the Twilight Zone and the spooky stuff as much as anybody, you know, and this is one of the reasons I'm here. And I do think it represents some of his best work. But if you were to ask me, what do you think the greatest thing Rod ever wrote was? I'd say Requiem for a Heavyweight. You know, uh, I, th I think it's unquestionably his greatest script. Yeah. There's nothing supernatural about it. So, you know, that, that's why I say, you know, I, I hope, you know, that uh, it, it is, you know, and I've talked to other writers about this. You know, some writers actually don't like being limited to genre. Other writers say, I wish I were a limited genre because then I would have been better known. Uh, yeah, yeah I, got, I got a friend, uh, Bill Nolan, William F. Nolan, who knew all the guys who wrote on the Twilight Zone. He was part of the same group, the California group. Uh, Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, uh, all those guys. Bill Nolan was, one of, was right there with them. Now, if you look at Bill Nolan's resume, it's pretty staggering. You don't know the name Bill Nolan, but if you, you looked up his, his resume, you'd just be stunned. You know, he's written horror, he's written science fiction, he wrote Logan's Run with, with George Clayton Johnson, another Twilight Zone uh, contributor. Uh, he's written biography, he's written books on, on, on automobile racing, he's written books on Dashiell Hammett and mystery, he's written mysteries. It's he, just a staggering, he's versatile. You're not rewarded for being versatile anymore. You're rewarded for being a specialist. You know, you 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 said it before about you know getting on my rants. Well, you know, this is a rant. You know, the the people who are the gatekeepers to uh, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable uh, art love specialists. They don't like people who are versatile. And versatility should work in your favor. It's why they love Hitchcock. They can get there, but you can, you can, Hitchcock did suspense and you can put a label on it and he doesn't go out of genre very much. He has a definite style and we can analyze that style and we can embrace that style. We don't think as much about Howard Hawks. You know, Hawks who could do anything. You know, Hawks who could do biography who could do westerns, who could do adventure, who could do comedy, who could do, who could do musicals. He could do just about it. Robert Wise, another great... I, I was going to say, The Haunting is one of the best ghost yeah. stories ever, but he's not really as known as everyone else. Great science fiction because he did The Day the Earth Stood Still. He did great horror because he did The Haunting. He did great biography because he did Somebody Up There Likes Me. He did great musicals because he did The Sound of Music and West Side Story. His resume just goes on and on and on, and yet... Wise is not considered the equal of the great directors. And it's because he, he's, it's almost people are suspicious now of versatility. Like, well, you know, if he can jump around that often, uh, there must be something wrong. Well, maybe there's something right. Maybe there's something right about that. And maybe there's more to this person than, you know, than just the haunting and the body snatcher. Maybe he's more, he, and, and you should know that. Uh, you know, and, and so... The people who study their, their passions, and this, uh, you know, go back to Bill Nolan. Bill Nolan laments the fact that he didn't settle down in one genre. And I keep thinking, well, it's a good thing you didn't. Look at all the great work you've done in all these different genres. You followed your passions. You followed your, 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 your you know, and maybe I feel that way because I've been that, that kind of writer. Is that, you know, my list of books looks awfully schizophrenic. <laughs> there's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's books on, you know, Stuff like Columbo and the Barter Theater. There's five Mark Twain books. There's, you know, uh, uh, there's there, there's stuff on the spooky side. You know, there's stuff on Dracula. There's stuff on the Night Stalker. You know, yeah. You know, my stuff is, is, is awfully schizophrenic, too. I remember being at a book fair once, and there was a selection of my books there, and somebody just shook their head and said, I don't get it. I was like, <laughs> What is there to get? And they said, well, I don't understand. What's the common theme? And I said, me, me, I'm the common theme. Does there need to be a more common theme? These are all my interests. These are all my passions. You know, 
I mean, you said that my last book was on the Twilight Zone. That's not really technically true. My last book was on Theodore Roosevelt, you know, um, which came out right, right after the Twilight Zone book. And that shows you, you know, right there, you know, it is. Uh, it, it is uh, and I'll, I'll cop to it that it's a deeply schizophrenic resume. Um, but, you know, it's, it, I, I hate repeating myself. That's one thing. And I love new challenges. And I like following my passions. I don't want to say, you know, just because you, you do all of this stuff in the horror field, that's going to cut you off. And if I was more successful, you know, that may have cut that stuff off, by the way, you know. Yeah. Because then all of a sudden my agent and publishers would be saying, what's your next horror thing going to be? You know, and now I can always go back to it with great enjoyment and great, you know, uh, I mean, my next book's going to be on uh, Stephen King, but it's uh, it's on Shawshank Redemption. So it's not about one of the supernatural stories. Yeah, I, I maintain it is actually a horror story, though. You know, the horror is a real life. Yeah, boy, is it? Is it ever? You know, I mean, you know, th that's a debate among fans, isn't it? That you know, somebody put that up the other day. Said, you know, is, uh, is Silence of the Lambs a horror film or not? And uh, you know, the general consensus was no. And I guess because it, well, it seems like more like a crime thriller, or it seems like it's, you know, but there again, what, there's our pension for labeling again, isn't it? You know, it has to be one thing or another. Why does it have to be one thing or another? Maybe it is a crime thriller, maybe it is a suspense, a, a psychological thriller, and maybe it's a horror story too, you know? Because if it's, it, 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 then you say like, well, well, what about Psycho? Is Psycho a horror film? And, oh yeah, Psycho's a horror film. Well, if Psycho's a horror film. Why isn't Silence of the Lambs? Yeah, you know? they're, they're, they're the same kind of thing, really. You know, why one and not the other? Um, but why? You know, sometimes it's like it's, it's this is a film I know I, we have. To, I can't remember which class we discussed it in, but I, I said, you know, uh, what is Jurassic Park? Is it, um, is it an adventure movie? Is it a horror movie? Is it a science fiction movie? Is it a fantasy movie? <laughs> is it all of the above or none yeah. of the above? You know, and you know, and I, I, I would say, you know, like, just because there are dinosaurs doesn't mean it's not a horror movie. Because actually, Jurassic Park, when you analyze it, is basically just a haunted house film. Yeah. All it is is that the house is now an island, and the ghosts that jump out and go boo every once in a while are dinosaurs. But everything else works along the conceit of the haunted house. And you have people trying to survive a time. What happens on a haunted house film? You get locked in all night, and you have to survive till till dawn. You know, so that's exactly what Jurassic Park is. Yeah. You know. Now I'm not going to argue with somebody who says, ah, it's not a horror movie. It's a science fiction movie because, well, all right, if that's what you see. That's fine. But why do we have to label it? Maybe it's just Jurassic Park. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that Frankenstein is a science fiction, it not is. a horror. It is. It's both. It had tremendous influence on both. That's for sure. But Mary Shelley certainly didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write a horror book or I'm going to write a science fiction book. She wouldn't have even known what those terms meant. You know, she just wrote uh, a book. <laughs> yeah, the only term that was in vogue at that point was gothic. You know, so she might have said, "I'm writing a gothic tale." You know, but yeah, I mean, this is this this is again the, the American mania for uh, for for lay for having to label something and and having to identify the shortcut. You know, and it's like, no, you know, is it is it good storytelling or isn't it? You know, is it how 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 effective is it? Uh, I'm much more interested in that than I am you know, what genre we have to put something in. Yeah. I guess sort of as we wind down here, uh, do you have any more words of wisdom for the viewers out there? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Drink your milk. Uh, <laughs> wow. it's, it's important to enrich. You know, if, if I were to be able to add one thing to somebody's DNA, it would not be wisdom it would not be humor. Um, it, it would be curiosity. I think the one thing that leads you somewhere else always is curiosity. Uh, 
if I were to, you know, I, and I'm, and I'm, I, I am loath to give life advice to anybody because who am I to give? You know, I'm just a, you know, uh, you know, a blue collar kid from New York. You know, who, what do I know? But if I were, you know, if somebody used to say, you know, what you just asked, I'd always say, you know, nurture curiosity. Because that's what's going to take you somewhere. Much more than knowledge. Much more. It's what inspires imagination. And imagination inspires knowledge. But it all starts with curiosity. It all starts with being curious. We are curious little creatures. That's what we are. When, when we're little, we're curious about everything around us, about the world. What works, what doesn't work. What we're afraid of, what makes us laugh, what makes us giggle, what makes us, uh, what makes us cry. We're, we're interested in all of that. And American culture of the last 20 or 30 years tends to shut down those horizons much more than they do to, to, to open those horizons. You know, you were curious when you were shown black and white at a certain age. And it made you curious about what, what else was behind what, uh, what else. And, and it led you from one thing to another to another. You know, that's curiosity that got you there. It wasn't interest. It wasn't, you know, it was it was the fact that, hmm, I want to know a little more about this. So if you see a director that you like, the first question should be, what else did this director do? If you see an actor that you like, you should, you know, the first question should be, what else did this actor do? If you watch a film, if somebody shows you a film and it contains a performance and you're not interested in what else that actor did, you are lacking in curiosity. Yeah. <laughs> and... So I would say that in all aspects of your life, you know, uh, it is, it's, it's the one thing which, cause you know, you can always get knowledge. You can always, you know, you, you your passions come, come, come front loaded. Um, they're there, whether you know it or not, you're going to respond to certain things. You're going to respond to it. It's, it's like, I always, you know, the, 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 the example I always use in the classes about, you know, somebody falling down. And that the human response is either to laugh or to rush towards the person with concern to see if they're all right. They're both deeply human responses, but you're not in control of what that response is. It's already in there. So the one thing that you can actually nurture is curiosity. And it, it, it should be, it, it should be there. Don't let somebody else give you the answers. Don't let somebody else provide you with the answers. Be curious enough to go get the answers yourself. And we live in an age where this is more possible than ever before. You know, you can, you, that's, you know, that's the wonderful thing about the internet is that it allows you to seek out the, the sources of information. Too often people just seek out the sources of opinion and the opinion is already tailored to how they think. And that's not going to increase curiosity. That's going to kill it. You're letting somebody else do the thinking for you. So, you know, that, that would be the, the, the last, you know, I mean, I love that word. I'm, 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 I'm deeply in love with the word curiosity. And, you know, I think one reason is because I grew up at a time when we were encouraged. And, and again, this has got, we don't get any credit for this. You know, I mean, this, this is, again, this is because I don't want somebody getting the idea. This is some, old fart just talking about how good the good old days were because there was a lot about it that wasn't very good and i could spend a lot of time talking about that but one of the good things about the culture in which i grew up in is we were encouraged to have our heads on a swivel meaning that we were encouraged to look back and see uh what had been done before what was the entertainment of our parents and grandparents we were interested in the culture of now and we were interested in what was around the, the, the bend, what was what was coming up, what's going to be the next thing. And so we were we were we were constantly looking in three different directions. And it would that's a very exciting way to live. It's a very exciting way to be. Um, you know, we had something back then which uh, has disappeared from television for the most part. And it's too bad because when we had a three channel universe, this was a lovely way of. Sure. And it's got, you know, it's got to sound funny, but it, 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 because it's, it's not something which has got a lot of praise. It's often something which is looked on as uh, some kind of maybe lesser form 
but it was the variety show. We had shows like the Ed Sullivan show. We had, you know, the talk shows, daytime talk shows, the Mike Douglas show, and things like this. And the amazing things about these shows, buddy, is that everybody watched them and everybody was getting dipped into everybody else's cultural and, the, and their experience. And, the, and, and it was wonderful. You watch the Ed Sullivan show. And in the same show, you might get an old vaudeville comedian, you know, somebody like Jimmy Durante or something like that. So you were seeing something from the past. And on the same show, you might get, you know, the doors. Yeah. And then that would be followed by somebody from the Metropolitan Opera. And that would be followed by some fantastic jazz artist. And, you know, and you'd get country and rhythm and blues and ballet. And all of this was souped up together. And it wasn't that you were going to like it all, but you got to sample it. How you didn't know, do you know you're going to like jazz unless you can sample it? Unless there's a way in. So everybody's culture was being mixed up together and served up together. And you got exposed to a tremendous amount of stuff from all over the spectrum. You know, maybe it was the Nicholas Brothers coming out and doing an incredible dance routine. You know, maybe it was, you know, uh, Beverly Sills from the Metropolitan Opera. You know, maybe it was the, the, the Clancy Brothers coming out and doing Irish music. You know, maybe it was the Rolling Stones. Uh, it was all there. It was all there. And we were all watching, meaning, you know, your, your parents were watching it. Your grandparents were watching it. You were all watching it in the same room at the same time. And that, boy, that creates curiosity. That creates real curiosity when, when you have something like that. Um, and we don't have those anymore. We don't have variety shows anymore. You know, you, you, what you have is one big variety show, which is the television spectrum. And the problem, you know, the great thing is, you know, and I guess this is always my old line about, you know, you gain and you lose. And we have gained unlimited uh, choice as far as television is concerned and access as far as television is concerned. But everybody sort of steers to what they're already interested in. So nobody is, you're not being steered over to, well, maybe you would like this if you sample it. No. We talked about horror and we talked about comedy. But you know, another thing I grew up listening to was country music. How does a New York boy... <laughs> Who's, you know, raised Polish, Italian, and Swedish, you know, get it well, because did you know that the biggest country music station in the 1960s was in New York City? Nashville's a small town. Nashville doesn't have much population. New York has, you know, 14 million people back then. It was reaching a tremendous amount. So you could be the, you know, sixth, seventh station in the market, and you'd still be reaching more people than listening in Nashville, Tennessee. And they tended to play really really good stuff not a lot of nashville sound junk you were hearing stuff like you know uh johnny cash and marty robbins and some really really good you know basic stuff roger miller and i was going like what's going on in nashville this stuff and then i later found out they were making a lot of junk in nashville too you yeah. know <laughs> i was hearing the creme de la creme stuff and you know it, it so when i started listening to, to to rock music i was much more listening to sort of the uh um, uh, the country rock and the uh, the folk rock stuff, you know, that was being done like like CSNY and people like that. Um, but that's because I was exposed to it. You know, I was given the chance, and at the same time, those artists would show up on these variety shows. Like, oh yeah, I I, I remember this guy. I remember I remember listening to this Johnny Cash guy. Yeah, so uh, he's, he's on the radio, and then he'd show up on uh, you know a variety show, and you'd go, wow. Oh, you know, there's something going on here. So, you know, that that's where I would leave it. You know, if, yeah. if, if, if that if, if that fills the bill, that's where I would leave it. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show. It was a great time. I hope to have you on again at some point in the future and talk about some other stuff. Okay. But, well, Shawshank's around the corner. So. Yep. <laughs> there's a lot there. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks everyone for listening, and we will see you again next time. 
Well, that is it for this season, guys. I want to thank you guys for checking out all the videos this season. If you haven't already, you can check out the links to all of them on my channel. I want to thank Mark again for coming on the show. You can check out all of his stuff at markdewisiak.com and make sure you go pick up some of his books on Amazon. That is it for this time, guys. Let me know what you'd like to hear next season and have a happy Halloween. Take care.